Food tracking is a method to quantify what we eat. More specifically, it can allow us to measure how many calories and how much of each macronutrient we are consuming per day. This can be helpful for the purposes of muscle growth and fat loss, since calories and macros have the largest effect on body composition from a dietary perspective. In this video, we will cover a complete guide covering how to set calorie and macro targets to maximize both muscle growth and fat loss. Before getting into how you should set your calorie and macro targets, we should first determine whether or not food tracking is even a strategy you should implement in the first place. For a more detailed explanation on this topic, there will be a link in the description for a video which discusses this topic in more detail. But as a brief summary, I think that most lifting enthusiasts, and probably most people conscious about health and fitness in general, should track their calories and macros for at least a short period of time at some point in their life. This can teach us about the nutrition profiles of each individual food, as well as our habitual diet as a whole. We can then take this knowledge and use it for the rest of our life to make better diet choices, even when we aren't tracking food. However, I don't think meticulous food tracking is a viable long-term strategy for most people. This is because it can interfere with social life and potentially contribute to disordered eating behaviours. Instead, I think that sporadic tracking combined with behaviour and habit formation is a healthier and more sustainable long-term approach to diet goals. So obviously in this video, we are looking at how to set calories and macros for those who are currently in a phase of food tracking. We should also be aware that food tracking is never going to be 100% accurate. This is because of two primary reasons. First is that this would require weighing everything to the exact fraction of a gram. Most people aren't going to do this, let alone have scales sensitive enough to detect this. Alternatively, most people are more likely to use serving sizes based on the label or even estimate some foods if it is more convenient. And this alone has some inherent inaccuracy built in. This was seen in this study which tested the actual calorie and nutrient content of some common snacks and compared this with the labelled nutrition information. This chart shows the actual weight of the food compared with what it was labelled as and how much this varied between different packets of the same snacks. For the most part, the labels were fairly accurate with the actual weight of the product, but there was a decent margin of variability. For example, Kellogg's Strawberry Pop-Tarts on average weighed almost exactly what the label stated, but this varied by plus or minus around 7% between individual packets. Furthermore, calorie content was not perfectly accurate for most foods measured either. For example, this granola bar was on average around 28 calories higher than the label suggested, and varied between individual bars by a further plus or minus 20 calories or so. And when it comes to macronutrients, labels also weren't always accurate. For example, this triple berry smoothie had on average 22 grams of additional carbohydrates, 1.3 grams of additional fat, and an additional 3.7 grams of protein compared with the label. Although these tortilla chips were quite accurate, being no more than 1.1 grams different in all macros compared with the label. So even if you were to weigh out every food and use the label information, chances are that you still aren't going to be 100% accurate with food tracking. And this isn't illegal or bad intentioned in most cases either. According to the Food and Drug Administration, protein and carbohydrate content labelled on a food must be present at 80% or more of the declared value and calories and total fat must not be more than 120% of the label value. So really, calories and macros can be up to 20% different from the label to be compliant with the FDA. So what all this means is that food tracking is never going to be 100% accurate no matter how hard you try. And this is okay, you don't need to be 100% accurate with calories and macros to reach your body composition goals. As long as you are within a rough ballpark of your targets, the long-term consistency is what matters most. You can also adjust calories and macros if you aren't seeing the results you expected. With all that out of the way, we can now look at how to actually set calories for your body composition goals. There are three main steps to help us set an appropriate calorie target. Step one is to determine our maintenance calories. This is the calorie range that will result in a maintenance of body weight over time at any given body weight. The reason we need to know our maintenance calories is so that we can decide if we want to gain, lose, or maintain weight for our body composition goals, which is the next step. 
So how do we determine our maintenance calories? Well, this takes some trial and error to be accurate, which we will discuss in step three. But to get a rough estimate starting out, there are two primary ways to do so. First is to use previous data to get a rough estimate. If you have already tracked calories before and knew what your rough maintenance calorie intake was, then the best place to start is somewhere around that number. We can then adjust this later on to make sure it is accurate. However, if you haven't ever tracked calories before, the best place to start is to use some sort of calculator to estimate it. There are many online calculators which can help you determine a general starting point for your maintenance calories. You simply input some variables such as height, weight, and physical activity level, and you can get a quick estimate. This is probably not going to be 100% accurate, but it will usually get you into a ballpark range to start with. You can then adjust calories later on, as we will discuss soon. It should also be noted that maintenance calories change over time based on numerous variables. Most notably, body weight, energy balance state, and physical activity will all influence your current maintenance calories at any point in time. Generally, your maintenance calories will be higher when you are at a heavier body weight compared with when you are at a lighter body weight. This was seen in this study which explored the effects of weight loss on energy expenditure. 17 obese adults were fed an 800 calorie per day diet until they lost 10% of their body weight. They then maintained this new low body weight for 6 to 8 weeks before dieting again until they lost another 10% of body weight. They then maintained this for another 6 to 8 weeks. It was found that energy expenditure was initially around 3,200 calories per day. After 10% weight loss, it dropped to around 2,600 calories. Then after 20% weight loss, it dropped to 2,200 calories. So as body weight was reduced, energy expenditure decreased. Furthermore, our energy expenditure also changes based on our current energy balance state. We generally see an increase in energy expenditure during a surplus and a decrease during a deficit. This was seen in this study which explored the effects of a surplus and deficit on energy expenditure. 32 healthy young men consumed a diet consisting of a 50% calorie surplus based on estimated baseline energy expenditure for one week. They then consumed a 50% deficit diet for three weeks followed by a 50% surplus for another two weeks. And during each phase, energy expenditure changed. Baseline energy expenditure was around 2,400 calories per day. It went up to around 2,500 calories during the initial surplus. It then went down to around 2,200 during the three-week deficit. But it then went back up to around 2,500 calories after the following two-week surplus. So it seems that our energy expenditure changes slightly based on what energy balance state we are currently in. And lastly, energy expenditure obviously changes based on physical activity levels. Generally, the more exercise we do, the more energy we expend. Although this doesn't seem to be a linear increase, it appears to be what is known as a constrained model. This idea was theorized in this research review. The authors propose that physical activity does appear to increase energy expenditure, but not in a directly additive way. As we perform more physical activity, other components of energy expenditure seem to be down-regulated. So the net total daily energy expenditure probably isn't as high as what we would expect. So once we have established roughly what our maintenance calories are, we then need to decide what state of energy balance we aim to be in. There are three energy balance states we can be in, a surplus, maintenance, or a deficit. A surplus refers to eating more calories than maintenance on average over time. This will result in body weight gain over time. From this energy balance state, we can expect to see the fastest rate of muscle growth compared with the other states, assuming we are performing resistance training. Although we would also expect to see a disproportionately greater gain in body fat too. Maintenance refers to eating approximately the same number of calories as your maintenance requirements on average over time. This would result in staying at the same body weight over time. During maintenance, it is certainly viable to build muscle mass via resistance training, although not quite to the same magnitude as a surplus. However, you can also expect to see minimal changes in body fat too. And a deficit refers to eating fewer calories than maintenance on average over time. This will result in a decrease in body weight over time. During a deficit, muscle growth is certainly possible, but the magnitude will be less than a surplus or maintenance. 
In most cases, we would only expect to retain muscle mass during a deficit, assuming resistance training is being performed. This means that we would also expect the majority of this lost body weight to come from body fat. Once we have decided on what energy balance state we aim to be in, we then need to adjust our calorie target to achieve this. First, let's discuss how to set calories for a surplus. Obviously, we need to eat more calories than our maintenance. However, the important question is, how much of a surplus should we eat in? Well, this is based on the rate of weight gain you are aiming to achieve. A bigger surplus results in faster weight gain, while a smaller surplus results in slower weight gain. But which is best for maximizing muscle growth? This question was explored in this study, which compared the effects of a faster versus slower rate of weight gain on body composition changes. 39 elite athletes from multiple different sports recruited from the Norwegian Olympic Sports Centre performed resistance training four times per week in addition to their regular sport practice throughout their off-season. Athletes were advised to gain weight at approximately 0.7% of body weight per week with either assistance from a nutritional counsellor or via their own intuition over an 8-12 to 12 week period depending on the length of their off-season. Both groups successfully ate in a calorie surplus over the time period for an average of around 10 weeks in both groups. However, the nutrition counseling group gained more weight, around 2.7 kilograms, while the non-counseling group only gained 1.2 kilograms. So the counseling group gained weight at a faster rate compared with the non-counseling group. In terms of body composition, both groups saw gains in lean mass, with the faster rate of gain achieving slightly more growth, shown in the blue. However, the fast weight gain group also gained significantly more fat mass, with the slow weight gain group gaining minimal fat. So it seems that to maximize the proportion of muscle growth achieved while minimizing fat gain during a surplus, we probably want to gain weight at a slower rate. As a general rule, gaining weight at a rate of no more than around 0.5% of body weight per week for a minimum of 6 months is recommended. Calories can then be adjusted to achieve this rate of weight gain, which is something we will touch on soon. Next, let's discuss maintenance calories. This is the easiest one. You just need to eat roughly at what your estimated maintenance calories are over time. You can refer back to step one to find out how to find your maintenance calories. It should also be noted that it is unlikely you will be able to maintain the exact same body weight every single day. Fluctuations in body weight from day to day are normal and expected. So as a general rule, maintenance can be considered as maintaining your body weight within an approximate plus or minus 2% of your average body weight for an extended period of time. And lastly, let's discuss how to set calories for a deficit. Obviously, we need to eat fewer calories than our maintenance. However, the important question is, how much of a deficit should we eat in? Well, this is based on the rate of weight loss you are aiming to achieve. A bigger deficit results in faster weight loss, while a smaller deficit results in slower weight loss. But which is best for body composition? This was explored in this study from the same research group as the previous study, which compared the effects of losing weight at a faster versus slower rate on body composition. 24 elite athletes from various different sports recruited from the Norwegian Olympic Sports Centre performed resistance training four times per week, in addition to their regular sport practice during their off-season. All subjects ate in a calorie deficit until they reached a target body weight loss of at least 4%, or more if it was a desired outcome of their off-season. Half the subjects were provided with a diet consisting of around a 500 calorie deficit, while the other half were restricted to around an 800 calorie deficit. This took an average of around 8.5 weeks for the slow weight loss group, and 5.3 weeks for the fast weight loss group. So essentially, one group lost weight at a slower rate for a longer duration, while the other group lost weight at a faster rate for a shorter duration. At the end of the intervention, both groups lost the same total amount of body weight. The slow weight loss group managed to gain a little lean mass during the diet, while the fast weight loss group approximately maintained lean mass. This also meant that the slow weight loss group lost more fat compared with the fast weight loss group. So it seems that to maximize the amount of muscle we are able to retain during a deficit, we probably want to lose weight at a slower rate. As a general rule, losing weight at no more than around 1% of body weight per week is recommended in most cases. Calories can then be adjusted to achieve this rate of weight loss. This brings us to step 3, tracking body weight and adjusting calories to meet our targets. We need to record our body weight regularly to see how our body weight is changing over time. 
This is the only true indicator we have to know if we are in fact in a surplus, deficit or a maintenance. Because like we mentioned, our estimated maintenance calories are just an estimate. It may be a couple of hundred calories off. So if we base our surplus and deficit values on an estimated maintenance calories, we may not even be in the energy balance state we think, or maybe not to the magnitude that we think. But if we track our body weight over time, we can see if we are truly in a surplus, deficit or at maintenance. For example, if we are aiming to be at maintenance calories, our body weight should stay within an approximate plus or minus 2% range. So although there will be fluctuations, the average trend over time is steady. However, if we were actually seeing slight increases in body weight over time, this tells us that we are actually in a surplus, despite thinking we are at maintenance. So in this case, you would want to reduce calories slightly until you see a steady body weight trend over time. And the same idea can be applied to achieve your target rate of weight loss or weight gain. Best practices to use body weight trends are to weigh yourself at least two times per week. And you should only look at trends over at least a two week time period and ideally longer. This is because shorter time frames than two weeks are subject to too much variability to see true trends. Now that we understand how to set our calorie target, let's now explore how to set macronutrient targets. More specifically, we are looking at protein, carbohydrate and fat targets. Before we discuss recommendations for each macronutrient, we first need to understand the relationship between calories and macros. Essentially, macros constitute calories. Both protein and carbohydrate contain 4 calories per gram, while fat contains 9 calories per gram. Alcohol is sometimes considered as a fourth macronutrient containing 7 calories per gram. So this should also be considered if you consume alcohol regularly. So the point to make here is that your macros are constrained to some extent by your calories. And your calorie intake can be influenced by your macronutrient intake. As an example, let's say we want to consume a 2500 calorie diet. We could consume 127 grams of protein, 340 grams of carbohydrate, and 70 grams of fat to reach our 2500 calorie target. Or we could consume 150 grams of protein, 250 grams of carbohydrate, and 100 grams of fat. So when we increase one macronutrient, we must decrease the others to accommodate the same total calorie intake. Let's now explore how much of each macro is best for muscle growth and fat loss. The first step is to set your protein target. This is the most important macronutrient for the purposes of muscle growth, so it should probably be prioritized over the others. So how much protein should we aim to consume each day? The best evidence we have is this meta-analysis, which compiled 105 studies, including around 5,400 subjects, exploring the effects of total daily protein intake on muscle growth. This data was analysed in various different ways, but this graph is probably most relevant, as it only included interventions involving resistance training. And as we can see, more protein tends to result in superior muscle growth, although there appears to be a diminishing returns response with higher intakes. Protein intakes beyond around 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day appear to be beneficial, but have less of an additive benefit. So as a very general guideline, trainees should aim to consume at least around 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram per day, or around 0.7 grams per pound per day to maximize muscle growth. Furthermore, this minimum value can be further individualized based on how much lean versus fat mass you are currently holding. Here is a table which can help you further individualize your minimum protein target based on biological sex, current body fat, and your dietary preferences. As we can see, leaner males following a plant-based diet probably require higher relative protein intakes compared with females of a higher body fat percentage following an omnivorous diet. These numbers are in grams per kilogram of body weight per day, while this table uses grams per pound of body weight per day. If you want to learn more about how these values were derived, check out the video linked in the description. Now, these are what would be recommended as a minimum intake if your goal is to maximize muscle growth or retention. However, you could also go beyond these values if you want to see slightly better results. The downsides of increasing protein intake are that you have less flexibility to eat carbohydrates and fat, high protein foods are generally more expensive, and you may not enjoy eating a very high protein diet, which could inhibit adherence. So I would generally recommend setting a minimum protein target and make sure to hit that target each day as your first priority. 
and you could eat beyond this target on the days that it is viable and if you have the calorie flexibility to do so. Your protein intake may also vary depending on whether you are in a surplus or deficit. During a deficit, you have fewer calories to play around with, meaning it might be more difficult to increase protein beyond this minimum level. While you may find it easier to consume a high protein intake during a surplus, because you have more calories to reach this target. Now that we have our protein target set, the rest of calories will come from carbohydrate and fat. So the question is, how much of each macro should we aim to consume with the remainder of our calories? Well, the answer to this is not entirely clear, due to a lack of high quality evidence in a resistance training setting. The best evidence I could find on this topic was this study, which compared the effects of a protein-matched low-carb, high-fat versus high-carb, low-fat diet on body composition. 55 men between the ages of 19 to 35 years who had been lifting at least three times per week for at least six months continued to perform their regular resistance training routines during a 12-week diet intervention. All subjects consumed the same relative total daily calorie intake, around 35 calories per kilogram of body weight per day. Relative protein intake was also equated at around 2 grams per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. However, fat and carbohydrate intake were different between groups. Half the subjects consumed a higher fat intake, around 131 grams on average, and a lower carb intake, around 285 grams on average per day. While the other half consumed a lower fat, around 65 grams, and a higher carb, around 391 grams, diet per day. After 12 weeks, the high-fat diet resulted in a slight reduction in body weight, while the high-carb group approximately maintained body weight. The high-fat diet approximately maintained fat-free mass, while the high-carb group saw a slight gain. And body fat reduced slightly in both groups, with a greater reduction in the high-fat diet. So this study may seem as if a higher-carb diet is slightly favourable for muscle growth. However, a major caveat here is that this study used whole body measurements as opposed to direct muscle thickness measures. This might be an issue because such measurements are subject to variability based on water and carbohydrate intake. So it makes sense that the lower carb group saw slight decreases in body weight and fat-free mass, while the higher carb group saw increases, possibly due to greater glycogen storage. So until we have more evidence on this topic, I think the best recommendations to follow are from this research review, which provides nutrition recommendations for natural bodybuilders. It was recommended that fat intake should be somewhere around 0.5 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day for normal health functions. Then once protein and fat have been allocated, carbohydrate can make up the remainder of calories, usually around 3 to 5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day, or even greater if your calories allow for it. Another consideration regarding carb versus fat intake is the energy density and subsequent satiety effects of fat versus carbohydrates. As we mentioned earlier, fat is more than twice as calorie dense compared with protein and carbohydrate. So even with calories equated, a higher fat diet means that less total mass of food will be consumed. And this likely has an effect on overall diet satiety. This was demonstrated in this classic study which compared the subjective satiety responses after consuming various different foods. Subjects consumed a 240 calorie serving of various different foods in the morning after a 10 hour overnight fast. They then rated how full they felt every 15 minutes across a two hour time frame after ingestion. Here are the average satiety results for all foods assessed. Foods such as boiled potatoes, lean fish and meats, oatmeal, fruits and brown pasta had the highest satiety scores. On the other end of the spectrum, croissants, cakes, donuts and chocolate bars had the lowest satiety scores. After analysis, there were a few general trends found between nutrient composition and satiety. It was found that the amount of fat in a product was negatively correlated with satiety, meaning higher fat foods were less satiating on average, while foods with higher amounts of protein, fiber, and water had a positive association with satiety, meaning they tended to be more satiating on average. Carbohydrate and starch content had a very slight positive association, but pretty much neutral from a practical perspective. This may influence our decision of our fat versus carbohydrate targets. A higher carb and lower fat intake will probably be slightly more satiating for most people compared with a higher fat and lower carb diet, even if calorie intake is the same. 
So it might be worth lowering fat intake during a deficit if you were feeling very hungry. Alternatively, you might opt for a higher fat intake if you were in a surplus and struggling to eat enough calories. So overall, trainees should probably try to at least hit the minimum fat and carbohydrate recommendations for health and function. More specifically, a minimum fat intake of around 0.5 grams per kilogram or 0.23 grams per pound of body weight per day should be met. And a minimum carbohydrate intake of around 3 grams per kilogram or 1.36 grams per pound of body weight per day should be met. Once meeting these minimum requirements, body composition changes are unlikely to be significantly different with the same calorie and protein intake. Trainees can then adjust the exact proportion of fat and carbohydrate based on eating preferences and their current energy balance state. So for some practical recommendations, let's briefly summarize what we have discussed. The first step is to set your calorie target. To do this, you will need to find your rough maintenance calories. Then, once this has been established, we need to determine energy balance. This is based on whether you want to gain, lose, or maintain body weight. To maximize muscle growth while minimizing fat gain, you should aim to gain weight at a rate of no more than 0.5% of body weight per week. To maximize muscle retention and fat loss, you should aim to lose weight at a rate of no more than around 1% of body weight per week. And for maintenance, you are just trying to maintain your body weight over time within an approximate plus or minus 2% error margin. You can then assess body weight trends over time and adjust calories to suit these goals. For macronutrients, the most important step is to set your protein target. This should be a minimum of around 1.5 grams per kilogram or 0.7 grams per pound of body weight per day on average. But this minimum target should be adjusted based on biological sex, body fat, and diet preferences. And it is probably going to be slightly more advantageous to increase protein intake beyond this minimum if it is viable for you. Once protein targets are met, the remaining calories will come from fat and carbohydrate. A minimum fat intake of around 0.5 grams per kilogram or 0.23 grams per pound of body weight per day is recommended for normal physiological health and function. And a minimum carbohydrate intake of around 3 grams per kilogram or 1.36 grams per pound of body weight per day is recommended to support exercise and lifting performance. Once these minimum requirements are met, the exact proportion of carbs versus fats is not all that important and mostly comes down to personal preference. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.